Hello, welcome to One Plus One. I'm Courtney Act. At just 22 years old, actress Georgie Stone has spent almost half of her life in the spotlight. Her determination to secure better treatment and understanding of young trans people has led her to have very private experiences lived publicly in court, in parliament and on TV screens. Is this the waterhole? Ah, uh, no. Oh. Close. Where are we? We are at Lassiter's Lake. The waterhole's actually just over there. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. On the set of Neighbours, of course. The set of Neighbours. Your place yes. of work. Yes, yes, and what a great place to work. What a great place. <laughs> but not your place of work for much longer because... Look at the show is coming to an end. Aww. Yeah, after 37 years. Sad. It is sad. It, it, it's very sad, but you know, we're just all trying to enjoy it as much as we can and celebrate the show while we're all still working together. Yeah. I mean, Neighbours is such a mainstay part of Australian culture. Um, it must be an exciting place to work. It is, it is, and it has been a wonderful place to learn from the very best. Yeah. I love it. Well, let's go find a place where we can sit down and chat. Yes, awesome. All right. Georgie Stone, welcome to One Plus One. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Now, we are not just in any old town centre. There's a florist, there's a cafe, there's an Australia Post. We are, in fact, at Lassiter's on the set of Neighbours, your yeah. place of work. Yes. What are some of the fun things that you've done around here? Oh, so much. We had a, a pride parade here early on when I was working here and the whole place was decked out in rainbow flags. Was I here for that or was that a different one? And you were here for that so it was extra special. <laughs> I am honoured to be here hosting Pride and they tell me everyone's welcome at Lassiter's. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even know where to start. I'm like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> and I'm the eye candy. Uh, how many times do I have to... Growing up, did you ever expect yeah. to see trans pride flags and gay pride flags hanging up at Lassiter's? Not at all. Not at all. It was... And I think that was one of the reasons why I wanted to work here. I'd seen this place as such, like, a wholesome, safe space, but, you know, besides the explosions that... <laughs> it's, like, over... Like, a, just a really beautiful... Uh, like, the epitome of, like, kind of Australian uh, ideal life. And I'd always dreamed that it'd be really awesome to kind of see myself in that world, but I never did. So that's why I really wanted a job here, so I could um, make that happen. I love that. And Neighbours is, of course, coming to an end. Uh, what does that mean? Um, yeah, it's really sad after 37 years where we're coming to an end, but I suppose... I mean, I, I've, I'm coming up to three years on the show, so I was ready to move on myself, mm -hmm. but um, I'm, I'm more sad for... All, all the, you know, future generations of young actors who who could have, you know, had their foundations here. I, I kind of, I can't imagine not having had this experience at Neighbours. I've learnt so much. I've grown so much. So it's it's just kind of sad to think that other young people aren't going to get that. Yeah. But it's just time for all of, all of us to move on, I think. And tell me a bit about your character, Mackenzie. So Mackenzie is um, a, a university student right now. She is studying law. Um, she's, she's a very bright, ambitious young person. She also happens to be a, a trans girl. The role of Mackenzie came about because you wrote to the executive producer of Neighbours and said, I've got an idea, right? Yeah, so I was in year 12 and we'd just done these, like, career interviews and and kind of being given advice of where you know we could go and I was getting really kind of annoyed at 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 all of it so I was like you know what I'm just going to I'm going to write an email to the executive produ producer of neighbors and and see how it goes and just pitch a character not really expecting anything to come of it I was just kind of like rebelling against um, my school um but then I, I got a response two hours later from, from Jason Herbison and um, he really liked the idea. What and was the idea? The idea was to have 
a, a trans young person uh, arrived in Neighbours who was the, um, the the secret child of Scott and Shirley, <laughs> which is so embarrassing. Um, but mostly, mostly I talked about the importance of having a trans representation on screen and how there hasn't been enough of that and how I, it would be wonderful to have a trans character who wasn't tragic but but hopeful and and someone that that people can can look to and learn from and and derive hope from um and that that neighbors would be the perfect place to do it um yeah and and then it happened which is crazy and it was only supposed to be for six weeks and and three years later I'm still hanging around Lassiter's. What do you think it would have meant for you seeing Mackenzie on Neighbours when you were growing up? It would have made all the difference for me. I, growing up watching um, Australian TV, it was it was quite an isolating experience because I didn't really see a, a lot of representation on screen. And when I did, it would perpetuate these stereotypes that I, I didn't think represented how I wanted my future to look like. Um, and so, and that really sent the message to me that that I was the problem, that there was something wrong with me, and so it was quite isolating uh, experience. So, so to, to to have seen a character like Mackenzie would have made such a difference to me, because really that just shows that there's a future. Mm. Um, and that was one of my biggest fears when I was a kid that I couldn't see a future for myself. Mm. Um, so I really hope that. Um, Mackenzie has been able to do that for other people. Yeah. I could imagine that many of those narratives and storylines uh, where you get to just be a character on a TV show must be wonderful. I know that you have spent a lot of your life, your real life, sort of dedicated to um, trans equality and ensuring access and rights for trans folks around the country. But I guess in a way as well, your presence on Neighbours, apart from just showing the lived experience of uh, of, a, of a human, there are also those important elements of trans identity that get to be conveyed through the television and people get to learn through a show them, don't tell them sort of process. Absolutely. And, and one of the main, I suppose, mission statements we had was, was to show the humanity hmm. of, of trans people because that's kind of the end game of what we're doing you know with our advocacy and our visibility is is showing that we are, we are humans like like any other and we deserve that respect and and uh and uh, the opportunity to just live our lives so i think what we wanted to do with Mackenzie was balance that educating people and and not erasing her transness because mm. that's a part of her but then also allowing her to just exist mm. on the street mm. and i think that is you know, as radical as anything. Just, just. Yeah. I, I think for us to just be and exist and be open and be ourselves is is a powerful thing to do. Um, just, just uh, our existence is is profound mm. and and awesome. Yeah. So often, trans identity is reduced to a certain set of stereotypes or to conversations about genitals or surgery and stuff like that. And then you lose the experience of hearing someone else's story and you just get sort of reduced to some, you know, often right-wing talking points. And I think that showcasing trans experiences as being akin to cis experiences is so important. And I guess the ultimate goal would just to be an actor on a TV show and not a trans actor on a TV show. I'm not here because I'm trans. I know that was the story that I, I, I pitched, but I'm here because I'm an actor and this is my job like it's any other person's job here and I, 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 just, want to, I, I just want to do that. But you're quite consultative in the process of your character and the storylines, right? One of the things that I really wanted was to have um, agency over... Uh, just an input into Mackenzie's story because we did want it to be um, authentic and respectful and, um, to their credit, the, the writer's room really wanted to, to do a good job with this. So I've been very lucky to be able to be a part of it and to be consulted and to have a say in, in how we tell mm. her story. A lot of people out there in Australia, they don't know a trans person mm. and perhaps their only contact is Mackenzie on Neighbours. I think the way we build empathy is that shared experience, mm. having to be, to, to be able to see 
yourself in a trans character, whether you're trans or not, it, if you're able to see their humanity and, and see what connects you and what is similar and what unites you, I think that is so powerful. In terms of representation, we can't just preach to the choir. That is important. We want to reach out to, to people um, who, who um, will benefit from seeing themselves on screen, but it, it's important to reach out to, to as many people as you can, mm. which is another reason why Neighbours was such a great place to, mm. to tell this story. Yeah. I had a really good time today. I hope you did too. Yeah, I did. I know a lot of today would have been so far out of your comfort zone. So it means the world to me that you came. <laughs> I feel like you're influencing Australia's perception of trans people through your portrayal on Neighbours. And then also, I came to know you through your advocacy work that you and your mum have done in the Australian court systems, mm. um, changing laws. Uh, back when you were 11, 12? 10, 10, I think, yeah. So just to talk us through it, usually for a young trans person, you know, in their under, under puberty age, mm -hmm. um, the only sort of process that parents or doctors might entail is affirming a young person's um, gender uh, with clothing that they might wear, with the name that they might like to be called, listening to the child, listening to what they're saying about who they are and sort of affirming that and following that. Absolutely. And then um, approaching puberty, some um, young people might seek to go on puberty blockers, which are essentially... Um, stopping that process of the puberty of the sex that you're assigned at birth. Yeah. It's really about um, buying you a bit of time. Yeah. Um, and because puberty blockers are completely reversible and it, it just offers you the time to, you know, think about who you are and your identity um, and, and not experience those changes um, that can be quite harmful to, mm. you know, a young person's mental health. And it's also good too to acknowledge that everyone's experience is different. Yeah. Some, you know, trans young people don't, don't want to have... Um, uh, medical intervention, don't need it or don't have access to it. So it, it really, the experience is quite individual. Mm. Um, uh, it really just depends on, on the person, the young mm. person. You mentioned um, the harmful effects uh, that can happen. Can you talk me through some of those? Well, for me personally, when I started seeing changes to my body at, you know, at 10, I was very young, um, that, that you know was was the beginning of of male puberty it was very scary i felt like i was i was losing control over my body and that's such a scary feeling to have to feel like you don't have a, a agency over what's happening to you and you can't stop it and and i knew that if if puberty hit and i had to go through that my my mental health would have just plummeted i don't think i don't think i could have made it mm. um quite honestly so in accessing gender-affirming medical care like puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones, um, when you started your transition, tell me about that process. So, so at that time, when I was around 10, even though I had the support of my mum and dad and had the support of my doctor who was at the Royal Children's Hospital, I still had to apply to the Family Court of Australia to access that care. So I went to court when I was 10 for access to puberty blockers, which is the first stage of treatment. Um, and then um, when I was 15, I had to go back for gender affirming hormones, mm -hmm. which was stage two. That sounds like it would be not only a costly process, but also a very stressful process for you and your family to go through. It, it absolutely was. For me, it was the very uh, definition of powerlessness. Mm -hmm. I had no voice in that process. Um, uh, the judge, a, a person who didn't know me at all, was the one who had the power to make the decision over my body, which was absolutely um, frustrating for me and, and, and I didn't quite understand um, why we, ha we had to do it. When the medical professionals, the parent and the child are in agreement over what is best mm. for the kid, in most other cases, that is enough. But the fact that trans kids yeah. have to go had to go beyond that to prove themselves 
is is transphobia. Yeah. So that's why my family and I wanted to change the law so that other young people and their families wouldn't have to go to court to access treatment that they should be, you know, entitled to when they have the support of their parents and a medical professional. Mm. Um, and that's what we did. And now young people um, going through this process don't have to. Yeah, so now um, we, we have taken the decision out of, out of the court, so um, young people do not have to go to court to access stage one or stage two treatment. George, it's not usual that a 16-year-old takes on such a big uh, campaign and personal journey. How I think Georgie is one of the most amazing young people I've ever met. It is hard not to notice her and to listen and believe that Georgie is going to change things for the better. I have no doubt about it. I remember watching your Australian story and that was one of the first sort of public things that you did and really brought your story into the mainstream. Where did it go from there? It was a really incredible stepping stone for me and my family because um, after the Australian story, I started a petition um, to, to, you know, kind of capitalise on, on the people who had watched the Australian story and now knew this issue that not a lot of people were talking about. Um, so we got up to, I think, 16,000 signatures in the months after the Australian story, which was incredible. And so then we went to Canberra to rally um, politicians um, to, to, to get some support for um, law reform. And um, I had a great time. I was 16 and I got weirdly confident when I was there and I'd just like slam down this massive fold of signatures <laughs> and go like, here, George Brandis, there, we've, we've got some support for this and you need to support us. And it felt great. Like I really felt I'd make grown men kind of like go, whoa, because I make this out <laughs> bang with my folder of um, names. It was, it was pretty cool. I loved it, actually. And that was an important part of that advocacy process. Yeah, it was just we're trying to get as much support um, as as we can, bipartisan support. You know, we were talking to, to to Liberal politicians, Labor, Greens. We were just trying to get as many eyes on this issue as possible. And you know, we were having enough of trans people getting ignored. Mm. Um, so so we were just doing whatever we could to 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 get eyes on this issue. And made real change. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm really proud of the work that we did. And your mum is a very special person to you. Um, she seems to have been the greatest ally through all of this. Um, she's written a book as well. Yes, yes. And tell me a little bit about your relationship with her. I feel like I just saw a little glassy eye come up Yeah, then. I love my mum. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really close to my mum. And, I mean, she has been... I, I'm lucky that both my parents are very supportive of me and my family is very supportive of me, but she has been that person from the beginning who has um, always, always been there for me and I just know implicitly that I can, I can trust her and that I'm loved. So, um, yeah, I'm very close with my mum. I love her very much. And, um, yeah, she did write a book um, called About a Girl and... Um, She's amazing. <laughs> oh, we love mums. We love mums. I mean, and any, any parents, any families, the, the, I guess the idea behind families is that you love and support your children, regardless of their gender or their sexuality or what job they want to do or, you know, whatever it is about their identity, you love and support them and you listen to them. And it sounds like um, you've been so fortunate in your family mm -hmm. that they have supported you and I think it's probably testament to the the wonderful woman that you are today, right? Like having that support and love. Yeah, well, I think I've been able to do the things that I've done because of, of that support and love. And I, I do consider myself incredibly lucky. For, for all the hardships that I've been through, I have had a very privileged experience and it, it's heartbreaking to, to, to say, you know, I had that support and that makes me lucky because that should be the, <laughs> the bare default. minimum. Yeah. That, that should be everyone's experience, but it's, it, it's not everyone's experience. In fact, most, most people don't get that. So it's, it's, I, that's not lost on me, that, mm. that the experience that I've had has been incredibly privileged. So to parents out there whose kids might be trans or who might be uncertain about their gender identity, what would you say is the best uh, thing for them to do? 
Um, it would be to listen to them when they want to talk. Do your research and don't and don't put the pressure on your kid to have to explain everything to you. Um, and and the best way to protect your child is to is to support them. Is to support them to go out of your way to support them, um, no matter what. Mm. What role do you think there is for education in schools uh, to educate on LGBTQ plus topics? I think, I think that's really important. I remember when safe schools came to my school, not for me, but for another um, trans kid. And it was really, it was a really beautiful experience. And, and, and the, the kids in my class um, really got a lot out of it. And that was actually what made me um, feel safe to come out to them. I wasn't out wow. at the time. It was safe schools coming for another kid. Um, and before they arrived at the school and giving this little seminar on, on just general queer students and seeing the kids' reaction to it, you know, changed a lot for me. So I, I, I've seen firsthand how important that is and how educating young people about LGBTIQ people isn't, you know, indoctrination or isn't, isn't um, dangerous. It, it's actually just... Of all the of all the uh, things that you can learn at school, I think that that is one of the most important things because you will take that into your own life. Mm. I think regardless of your identity, right? If you're learning about people with a different experience, it not only helps, you know, the the trans people see their experience reflected or the queer people see their experience reflected, but those other students who aren't queer then go through life having a bit of an understanding. And and so often it's, you know, the the transphobia and the queer phobia. That is the problem. It's yeah. not the the queer person, and so to inform and educate all of those other people is going to reduce yeah. um, the discrimination that those people face in public. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a win, 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 and not just for the students, for the teachers as well, and for the parents. I think there's so much that can be um, gained from from not erasing that. Mm. What it does, it just equips people with enough understanding to be able to, to interact and have a connection with, you know, a, a queer person and, and not feel so unsure of yourself. Because I think a lot of it is, a, a lot of the issues that we have in terms of supporting um, queer people in Australia isn't from malice, it's from ignorance. Mm. And just a fear of if you meet someone you don't know, you don't want to say the wrong thing, so end, you end up just not saying anything and it's just really awkward and, 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 and weird. Um, just having that just very general foundation of knowledge can make such a big difference. Yeah. And so often, you know, we sort of hinted then saying about, um, you know, it's not brainwashing or it's not this and and the and the reason we would talk like that is because so often queer identities and trans identities are used usually by the you know the right wing and the sort of more religious extreme types to you know weaponize trans identities in politics and I just want to know what what that's like like what sort of what that obviously must do damage to some of the most vulnerable people in our community um, and if you can just sort of tell me a little bit about that feeling and, and why those conversations are so damaging. Um, it's, it's incredibly damaging. So often trans people, especially trans kids, have been thrown under the bus um, where, when it comes to, to politics. I don't think that being queer or, 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 or you know, trans sh should inherently be political. It's become politicised. Mm. Our existence has become politicised because often, you know, the far right want to, you know, use us to generate fear. Mm. You're just a human who's trying to go to school, who's trying to play sport, who's trying to use a bathroom like everybody else. I exactly right. Our existence has been used to create moral panic and fear mongering and, you, you know, and, and what is so dangerous to them is that our our being open and completely ourselves completely debunks that. You know, it's not like having that representation will make you trans because then if that's the case, how come I, you know, am trans and I actually didn't see anyone who was trans when I was growing up. Mm. It really just gives people the sense of self. We want to feel safe everywhere. We want respect 
and just a little bit of dignity. Yeah. We're just asking for what, what everyone else yeah. has and, and really and get to enjoy. And that's not a big thing, but to, to a lot of people, they see that as us wanting to take power away from other people or it, it somehow jeopardises their privilege mm. that we get to, to, to live our lives freely. Um, and that's not the case. Yeah. You have got a documentary that uh, is called The Dream Life of Georgie Stone that is coming out soon on Netflix. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that and why you wanted to tell that story. Um, so that documentary came about. The incredible Maya Newell, um, who's the director, approached my mum um, through her support group in 2014 um, and um, wanted to, to, to work with young trans people and, and film them and learn a little bit about them and, you know, hopefully create a project out of it. So she started filming me at 14. I ended up being the only kid that she filmed. And so from the age of 14 onwards, she's been, you know, coming into my life, filming little bits here and there, just about my growth through the advocacy that I've done with my mum. And it's going to be on Netflix, which is crazy. It's, it's great. We didn't know what we were making when we were filming it. We had no idea really what we were, there, there was no firm plan at the beginning. It just sort of evolved as as it went along. But it's very exciting. It is, and it's a great watch. And I think, again, it just will help to educate people and help them to understand, um, you know, your experience of, of your identity, which I think is so important. Absolutely. And one of the things I'm proud of with this film is that I have had full creative control over what goes in and what doesn't. So often with, with, um, with the advocacy that we've done, our story, we've told our story, but it hasn't been on our terms. Mm. It's always been filtered through someone else's lens. This is purely through... Um, my lens and Maya's lens and um, it, that is really empowering to feel like I have absolute control over what has gone in. So it, it, it's been great. And Neighbours, wrapping up filming uh, in a couple of weeks here and a couple of months on the telly, what is next then when you, when you walk out those front gates? Where are you going? Oh, um, well, it's, I'm going into the unknown a little bit, which is weird. I got this job right out of high school. So ever since, I've, I've always had something to do since basically kindergarten. So it, it's, it, it is kind of this period of unknown for me, which is frightening, but very exciting. I am writing a few things. Um, I have a few ideas um, and... I, I suppose I, I just want to keep my options open. I want to keep acting um, and my dream would be to set up a production company so I can create projects for myself and for other people. I love that. Georgie Stone, thank you for joining me on One Plus One. Thank you, Courtney. It's been an honour.